Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. It's a Bitcoin Podcast. The only one that's making your money is you. So Bitcoin podcast. This is episode number 314. Uh, it's wow. yeah, it's pie. It's pie episode 3.14. That's right. Um, it's been a while. Uh, wait, I'm the host that talks first. D, and I'm another host finally back from my parental leave, slash, I don't know if you can really call it leave. Uh, but Dr. Corey Petty, what's up, everybody? We're so progressive, bro. You had uh, daddy leave. Look at us. That's what happens when you work for like modern companies. Look at us being progressive. Or or any company outside the U.S. Yeah, (laughs) the U.S. is like work until you fucking die. I want you to. Yeah. (laughs) I want your soul to seep out into my business. Do it. Yeah. Um, Sacrifice yourself for my money. Time? What is time? Uh, Well, you know. So, so Corey had a baby, I think. Yeah, man. Little boy, Declan Oliver. Declan. That Went is extra Irish with it. Hell of a name. That is some, I'm going to be an immortal that is challenged with cutting off other mortals' heads to, to, to take their spirit kind of name right there. That is a Highlander-ass <laughs> name right there. Yeah, dude. There can only be one. Yeah. There's, this is only going to be one, Declan. That's for damn sure. <laughs> I don't know if there's... I've never heard of that name in my life. It's very... Nah, unique. you haven't... No, it's not It's not unique. It's it's very Irish. It is? Yeah. Mm. Well, what was it like, bro? Mm. That's hard to get into. Well, it's, uh, I mean, like, it's like, the good parts. Like, what is it like, a maje- like the majestic parts? Like, I don't know, like, well, for one, like, I don't think we can have credit to women for pushing shit out like that. Like, <laughs> we did a home birth, mm-hmm. and I, like, watched it all happen, or the part of it, that's just like, Jesus Christ, like, not only are you carrying this thing around for nine months, you gotta do that. Uh, Why were you watching it? Like, I'd imagine that's something you would Why wouldn't see. you? It's like, it's, I don't know, it's one of those situations, this is, this is my stance on a lot of, like, things that feel questionable to a lot of people, like... It's a it's a unique and rare human experience, and why would I not do it, even if it's bad, even if it's like hard to do? You should do you should do it just so you experience it as a human because you don't get the opportunity to otherwise. I just feel like that's what. And it's not. It's like it's like the miracle life and all that stuff, right? You should like. Also, it's like you should kind of like. It humbles you and gives you a different perspective on kind of what strength is or different kinds of strength and things like that. And I think that's, that's also an important like experience to have. To me, it just feels like, you know, when you were a kid and your parents have their friends over and then they have, there's that one friend that has that jerk kid who comes into your playroom and just starts breaking all your shit. Like, I feel like that's what it is. Like somebody's coming to my playground, breaking all my shit. That's what it, that's what, but also, that is a very immature perspective. <laughs> That's of a it. very, I can, a very <laughs> immature perspective. I can, I can see that now. I as I hear it coming out of my mouth. That's that's part. That's part of the ridiculousness of it. Is that all that snaps back? Oh man, it goes back. It's fine. Mm, mm-hmm. It's nuts. It's fucking nuts. But I mean, right, yeah. It's so it's been. Yeah, all the cliches, right? Like, you know, your whole worldview changes. You can't explain it until you witness it, all that nonsense. It's all true. But more often than not, it's just you're really, you're really tired because you don't sleep anymore. 
Nice. But there's something beautiful about operating in very minimal sleep. It's like you're sharp. Or at least no, you think no, you are. No, it's not. That's stupid. That's a stupid thing to say. You think it's, you're sharp. You're, you're out, 100% wrong. You're out here <laughs> saying a bunch of dumb shit. It's <laughs> fucking awful. Yeah. I have, I have, like, basically what happened, especially this early, early on in having a baby, is you have a sack of potatoes that doesn't do anything, and it's your job to keep it alive. All it does is cry, shit, and eat. Nice. And it's, it's, it, but it's cute. It's real cute. And your job is to keep it alive, and you get to help now. Very much like the early that's, stages of that's the guy. owning a Tamagotchi. Very similar. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't do anything. Yeah. So, um, well, Sorry for the you guys just listening to hopping into the Bitcoin podcast. If you're new to the Bitcoin podcast, uh, we've been around a while uh, and we talk about crypto like you should expect from a show called Bitcoin podcast. So the first thing I want to talk about today, Corey, is Kanye West is running for president this year of the United States. Dude, what what is this? Fucking year, dude? <laughs> this is the Sorry. I saw that this morning. This is not this is not crypto related. So if you came for only crypto talk, you're gonna have a bad time. <laughs> uh, this 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 year is so weird. Yeah, it's I don't so even weird. want to talk about that. It was just a joke. But um, something that I I did see and I did actually kind of think was cool um, is that Bitcoin is now the tenth largest money in the world, excluding gold and silver. Out of 180 fiat currencies on the planet, Bitcoin has overtaken 170 of them, which is. I'd like to see. Well, for one, like, I don't know. I, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be a little Debbie Downer here. Shit, that's cool. Shit on it, bro. Shit on it. That's one. That's that's cool too. And put it in perspective, like, who gives a shit about those other 170? They're like, they're fucking so, terrible currencies. Somebody in the Philippines. They're right terrible now is currencies. Upset. <laughs> like you know what I mean, and and then if you compare that to like the dollar, like if you compare, I would say let's put the, the top two maybe because the like yuan is probably pretty high. I haven't looked at these things. There's only like probably three real currencies in the in the, in the world. Mm-hmm. There's the dollar, and the other ones are just like so far behind. If you look at like percentage wise, like the like the relative distribution and, and power of these things, dollar is way up there. Yuan is is, is close because they're they're vying for global power and things like that. I'd, I'd imagine Euro. maybe a rupee or something. I don't know. Euro is definitely high up there. The pound was. There's, there's only a few that matter. It's awesome that Bitcoin is in the top 10, but like probably like six through 10. Well, hold on, man. This is or, a sorry, celebratory. Four, four or five through 10 or, or, or shit currency. Let's, let's, let's not sully the victory here. I mean, we're talking about a crypto. We're talking about a digital asset birthed from the forums of an anonymous dude not owned by any country, not regulated by any governing body, just some nerdgasm project that has grown in 10 years to be a viable contender. If your country has a shitty government, it is a viable contender as a monetary base. Let's not so data that. scientists and me. One, you're right. I'm just I'm I'm giving perspective. You can't just like go all out and be like this is the greatest thing in the world and not have like another perspective here. Right. Cause That's true. like, I wonder what number they're using to give that it's just total market cap of the total supply. So basically it's, it's the current price times the total amount of, of tokens that are potentially in circulation. Is that where they get that number? Which is, which is normally called the total market cap. It's literally the first comment on this Reddit post. Is, this is meaningless if you don't state what metric you're comparing currencies. Market cap, smallest unit. <laughs> yeah, right. So um, like, I think it's market it's just, cap. This is, this is statistics. This is like one of those like marketing statistics thing. Like if you give me a bunch of numbers, I'll I, using statistics, quote unquote, I can make them say whatever you want me to using like real statistical methods. But that doesn't mean it's ethical or right. That's true. So when we say tenth largest, we mean tenth, not tenth at all, by even uh, not a, not at all. So sorry, this ain't the hype pod, hype Bitcoin podcast. I tried <laughs> the realistic it. Bitcoin. I podcast. tried to sneak it in. I I did. I tried to sneak it in. I'm back, baby. Um. <laughs> so 
in other news, DeFi is going to collapse. And are we ready for that? That's what I want. I want to ask you that question, Corey. Are you ready for the collapse of DeFi? <laughs> that seems so inevitable to me at this point. Why, in time. why does it seem inevitable to you? I'm not going to I'm not going to respond yet. OK, it seems inevitable to me. I want you to tell me why you think it's I'll, inevitable. I'll, I'll tell you why. I'll give you I'll give you my opinions, my strong opinions here, um, because every single time. These smart contracts get a little too big in their britches. Some Jeffrey comes along sitting in his basement or maybe his loft and he finds some sort of vulnerability and drains that motherfucker like Jenna Jameson used to drain trouser snakes in the 90s. And we've seen it so many times. I've seen it so many times. The Dow, uh, this other fucking Dow, not too long ago. Um it's just what happens. I feel like there's just an overabundance of confidence in something that's so immature. And to me, it doesn't make sense. But it does make for good memes because yield farming has made some very funny, funny memes. All right. It's a reasonable, it's a reasonable assessment. Uh, you're right. It's probably going to collapse. It's going to be but bad. But like, so what? Um, People are going to lose money. I don't know. Do I, don't, mean, I don't so think what? It's- yeah, they're putting a lot of money in some extra risky shit. Yeah, I guess so. And they're doing it in a, in a very haphazard way. And this is coming from like a security perspective of like smart contracts in general on Ethereum, uh, like the whole technology in mm-hmm. general. Uh, but it's necessary. Like I think this is a necessary step towards it actually working in the end because the difficulty in which to um destroy some of these like more foundational protocols that are hard like that are like supporting the underlying currencies like like die or compound and these things um is is much 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 higher to compromise than it was say for instance during the dow and that's because we've grown tremendously as an ecosystem since that hack happened based on um the standards of how you build smart contracts, the types of things you're looking out for, how to assess risk, um, having more like hardened, useful coding, like pieces of code to use for smart contracts. Like so best practices for writing smart contracts, Uh, the tooling involved for how you build these things that automatically checks for simple problems you may be having. Uh, We have a lot more experts in the field, uh, quote unquote experts. So like there's more experience and wisdom and available programmers to make these things that you can hire as opposed to like, you know, hiring that one guy that's out there that knows how to do smart contracts and hopes he does a good job. Like there's so much more that we have now than we did back in the early days of the DAO that it's much more difficult to do the same thing. But we still have a lot weight, a lot more, a lot further to go to get to the point where they can actually be the foundation of a trillion dollars. Yeah. And until we get there, there's going to be bumps. People are going to people are going to screw something up. There's going to be bugs because it's software and humans are writing it, and the underlying programming language isn't that good, relatively speaking. But like, it's all necessary. We, these things have to happen in order for us to figure out uh, to better figure out how to write these things, how to like mm-hmm. monitor them after they've been written, et cetera, and how to assess risk and maybe make insurance for these things because that doesn't even exist yet. So like, when you think about DeFi. There's like a very few, shout out JT, insurance products out there that are trying to like give you some, like a modicum of of kind of confidence that if something breaks, you can still be re- like compensated back or like you have a safety net. Why Those things are just being built now. Why would a company in their right mind try to insure something this risky? It's almost guaranteed that you won't make any oh, money. Oh, they can make a lot of money. Yeah, oh, you but, can make a lot of money doing but that. But how? It's you're if you're paying out for these claims all the time. You're not. You're not paying out for these claims all the time because you think about that one thing that breaks. Well, there's like thousands of things out there. All we talk about is the thing that breaks, not the things that are currently working. Or like, you like for for instance, you're not going to have a good insurance product um, until you have. Uh, that insurance ma- mandating that the thing they insure go through a specific ar- amount of like security checks and risk assessments. Cause like, that's how you like any insurance company has to do a risk assessment 
which means that they have to be able to like assess risk on something so that they can quantify how much the premiums cost. Yeah, that's and what like I'm saying. It's... How, how much that costs relative to like how, how, what's the likelihood of it getting broken? And since the likelihood of getting, some, getting something broken today is really fucking high, you can be damn sure that people are, who are using these services are paying a lot of money. Mm-hmm. So you can make money. It's just you're going to be making payouts too. But like tell me an insurance company that doesn't make any payouts. There's not many, but there's certain things that are more risk that are less risky that you make more money on. Oh, I'm not going to make an insurance product. That's for damn sure. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to play that game. It's like uh, I just feel like good old fashioned capitalism is going to take this entire industry by its nuts, and oh. and some <laughs> kind of like money making schema. Not a not a bad scheme, but some schema that exists already is just going to be copy pasted on top of crypto and guide it down a, a, it's a gonna, path. It's going to get gross. And this is like this is my least favorite part about this technology is remaking the financial industry. So like, you, you think we're just going to do a better job of it? No. And like everything's going to be altruistic. It's and be- like, no, it's going to be it's going to be gross. You're going to bring all those seedy ass gross people into this ecosystem. And they're going to be like, what? I have less rules now. Yeah, it's going to be gross. It's going to be gross. <laughs> like I was, um, because I'm thinking of starting my master's here in finance, and I'm just you know looking over the subject material, looking over what I'd have to learn, and I'm just like. These motherfuckers are gambling on acid with everyone's wealth every day. Like they, they, they probably wake up, slam their head into the desk with some fucking coke, breathe it in mouth and nose, and then just, and then just start like a Scarface. Yeah, they got that Scarface thing. They, they scar mouth of coke every fucking morning, and then they're they just brush like, my teeth, pound my face into the coke, and we're good to go. Yeah, and and nobody even understands it it's just so phenomenal to me like and then you've got situations like apparently the stock market has had the the most profitable quarter than it's ever had which is phenomenal to me phenomenal because the stock market's been around for a long time in the middle of a global pandemic and like china's about to go to war with india kind of and uh the uk is basically just a shithole now i think um, sorry for UK listeners, but I'm, I think you guys got it going on pretty bad. If I could be fair, if I could be fair about it, I mean, <laughs> I mean it's pretty the, bad here. The, it's pretty bad here. Oh yeah, don't. I'm not even talking about what's going on here. I mean, there's a lot of shit going on here in the states. There's basically protests everywhere. Uh, people are just figuring out that black people matter. Like, there's a lot of shit going on <laughs> all over the planet, and yet the stock market is like because these motherfuckers are face. They're fucking face smashing piles of coke and playing with numbers all day long. And it's only going to get uglier when you hear news like Visa is recruiting Solidity devs. And I'm like, holy shit. What the fuck do they need to do with Ethereum? They don't need to do anything. Yeah, I think that's that's my, I don't know, what I, I don't know, worry about. I don't know if that's the right word, but like. It's going to be really hard to hold on to that ethos that we joined this space for. Yeah, man. As this like huge ecosystem joins and becomes a part of us, right? And their goals, motivations, desires are significantly different than the like the 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 people's who started this whole this whole trend like the like the bitcoin like say the bitcoin ideals Mm -hmm. original bitcoin ideals and so holding on to those as these protocols are built we rebuild rebuild finance it becomes um what becomes newsworthy because that's where all the money's being flowed it's going to take a lot of attention away from the other stuff that's happening that's like really 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 cool and inclusive and Mm -hmm. helping people and like and as de- decentralized and distributing pa- distributing power across the many as opposed to like in the hands of very few, all of these like things that we wanted to do with a peer-to-peer decentralized trustless system are just kind of going to get like over yelled. I don't know what the word is for. Like they're going like, to they're going to be diminutive in their voice compared to mm-hmm. like you know 
the, the, like the DeFi movement, yep. if that's what you want to call it. I think you can never underestimate humanity when it comes to like software. I just think we can't. What does that mean? I, that means that, okay, take the original, what was it, Stanford and Colorado and one other university that invented the internet. I think it was like three universities. They invented the internet. And they were like, this shit's going to be dope. We're going to have online libraries. I can talk to any university on the planet. We can do so much cool shit. And then fast forward the clock, 40 years, porn. It's a it's a porn network. The internet, the internet is primarily <laughs> utilized to share porn. Is that true, though? Dude, is that true though? Yeah. Is that just like is that just your experience? Because no, that's what that's you that's did. That's not with just it. my experience, although I am experienced. But that is the <laughs> experience of the internet. Like for every one I wanna, time, I want some sourcing. I'm just being for real. I want some sourcing I, on that. I might open my <laughs> online banking app what once a week, but I know that Pornhub gets <laughs> opened more than once a week. I just, I just, I, I don't need to be. I don't need to do rigorous research. I've already done enough rigorous research personally, but I know that like around the planet, it's porn. The number one use for the internet is porn. There's no, there's, I can guess that with like 70% certainty. And so what I'm saying <laughs> is when it comes to like software, you know, or electron, you just can't underestimate the power of humanity just to make it human. And when it comes to these like programmable money, come on, man. We thought bankers were savvy before. This open source programmable money is going to get hijacked so hard. So hard. And then they're going to take all that wealth and they're going to get themselves some lawyers and some lobbyists. And then we've got this new culture that we created and didn't know we were creating. (laughs) It's going to be a wrap. If it's not already a wrap. So. But. That's inevitable, though. Like. There's, I don't think there's any way you can't get around it. No, right? you can't. You cannot get around that because you can't make something that's generalized and useful and then cut out the things you don't want it to do, period. Yeah, you can't. So, so, but at the end, those people you know, exist, you're not stopping it. In the meantime, there's this cool aspect of it that you can invest in it, and hey, it could be a smart investment for you. So, um, yeah, there's that. I like the idea. I like the idea. And we've talked about this before multiple times, mostly in reference to kind of the ICO boom and everyone's reaction to it mm-hmm. was uh, creating a culture a much more broader culture across the globe of how to think about money appropriately mm-hmm. like that, that um, allows people to start thinking about money and using money. Uh, in a way that's more akin to how rich people do it, the wealthy people do it. Uh, so you like you 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 shorten or, or close that discrepancy between uh, the thinking mentality of uh, like poverty and rich, or poverty and wealthy, because they're able to even process the idea of thinking about money and future gains to money and how to use it and how to make money work for you, um, kind of much much more. Which I think is a useful skill to have in in a, in a lot of ways. Just even outside, mm-hmm. like, yeah, they may make money, they may not, but at least they're thinking about their money. Because exactly. like when I was growing up, and this stuff didn't exist, no one thought like I I, I was in middle class America, but like I never got taught this stuff. No one ever like I had to go out and find it. Yeah, man. Um, I um. I actually had a thought about this just the other day. If no, if no one is capitalizing on like micro investing, and and what I mean by that is every dollar I think of in percentages, right? Uh, if you take one dollar that you make, a percent of it goes to your electricity bill, a percent of it goes to your, you know, your your internet bill, a percentage of it goes to your water bill, so on and so forth. But there's always an excess percentage for most everyone. Some people there's not. But for, but for most everyone, there's an excess percentage. And even if that excess percentage ends up being like five pennies, we'll take the five pennies and invest them in something. Right. And by excess, I mean, like, 
you know, you've already paid all your bills. You got your food. You're good to go. You maybe put, you know, a little bit of money away to go see a nice movie or something and hang out. Uh, but there's always that excess, that percentage. And no matter how large or small that percentage, you should be investing that percentage. There's not a lot of vehicles where you can put five pennies into something, right? And expect a monumental gain. But that's not the point. The point is you put five pennies into something and then a year later, your five pennies is worth eight pennies. Right? That's the idea. It's a concept. It's a concept. So like whenever you do have, like whenever you end up getting to the point of having money that has substantial gains, you're already doing the right thing. Yeah. And in some cases, you doing it all that time may actually get you to that point earlier. And it compounds over time. So... Yeah, compounding interest is... Mm. It's powerful. Mm. It's very powerful. Mm. But, I don't know. I, th- I think I think crypto's headed a good way. Like, there's more... I get more and more weekly evidence that this is this stuff isn't going anywhere and it's going to be monumentally spread and adopted in many, many more ways than I could have imagined. Um, like, there's things I get excited about. I like the idea of robots paying other robots to work. I feel like that's a future we're going to live in. I don't know. To me, it just feels oh, right. Oh, for sure. It just it just feels sure. right. So, um, and those robots, I got I got a, I got a clue for you guys listening. Those robots aren't going to be paying other robots in dollars. At least no. not straightforward. Well, I read something. Now, I'm not up on my news because I've been taking care of a baby, but uh, I'm seeing some. Uh, this, this is also like mainstream media or crypto mainstream media like i'm some some inklings of a united states digital dollar yeah a lot of a lot of uh central banked digital coins coming out don't get me wrong I, their implementations suck because i've looked at a lot of them uh but mm-hmm. they're 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 gonna do them so it's a matter of time before you have basically cryptocurrencies that are not trustless and permissionless um but are the ones that you pay taxes in yeah, man. What's his name? Not what's his that name. That scares me. Wayne That's has a brilliant fuck. theory about how the governments get their hand on on um, like Bitcoin because it is essentially gold. But just kind of like um, just kind of like how governments it's a little bit easier with physical gold, right? A government could just say like, hey, I want it. Fort Knox. Yeah. Like I'm taking I'm it. Taking I'm taking it. Here. And here's a bunch of guns in your face. And if you don't like it. You have two options here. Go to jail. You have three, actually. Give me the gold, go to jail, or get shot in the face. Which which option do you want? You, people are usually like, oh, okay, well, here's the gold. Do I at least get it? No, you don't get shit. Give me your gold. Right? And that's that's how it goes in, in the history when it comes to gold. But when, when it comes to confiscating Bitcoin, it's not that easy. Right? Because somebody, they can say, give me your Bitcoin. You can say, like, no, I don't have any. And it would be like, well, yeah, you do. We know you do. And you're like, prove it. And they can't. If you're smart with how you own your Bitcoin, they can't. Right. That's a big if. Right. Because it currently stands. There's the only if there's few people that can that can be that if. Yeah, there's there's a there's a small percentage of the population that can be that if. So if they ever wanted to confiscate, I'll put that in print in quotations, confiscate, then they would incentivize people to hand over their Bitcoin in return for the USD coin, the, the 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 digital dollar coin, with some tax incentives, with some recurring tax incentives. Like, hey, if you hand over your Bitcoin, then your purchasing power on your dollars is worth more, or your incentive, your tax incentives are, are are better. Like, you won't be taxed as hard, and we have a digital record of you turning in your Bitcoin. Like, he's actually got some pretty good and he called them like uh wayne called them airdrops like every year for five years you're going to be airdropped this many uh digital dollars because you handed over your bitcoin and i'm like well damn that is kind of kind of genius but that's how i would see i mean i kind of agree with wayne that's how i would see a government doing that to get people to hand over all of their public public blockchain based crypto tokens that they felt were a threat to their system, well, they would incentivize you to just hand them over and then they just sit in a bunker somewhere and they don't do anything. So that was very savvy. Well, very s- I mean, based on that interview we did about the black net, like the dark net, and um, 
like a good portion of uh, global powers are using Bitcoin to facilitate things that they wouldn't that they can't publicly do. It's reasonable for like I don't know like that that may be the the playground that nations have is using something that is jurisdictionless like Bitcoin to like kind of juxt like like uh, what's the word I'm looking Dance. for like, Fight for power, yeah. Yeah, that's. I mean, governments do dirt too. That's that's what some people don't realize. Governments do a lot of dirt. Well, people realize it definitely, but um, <laughs> I think people know yeah, that. Yeah, people. Yeah, they're pretty. I'm pretty sure they know. People, people don't know that. Ah, <laughs> uh, shit! I forgot. I'm back. I don't have a technical explainer for people. I did not prepare one at least. Um. I'm trying to keep keep those going. I got one. Hardware wallets. Let's talk about. No, I'm kidding. No. Oh, yeah. Okay. I can do that. I'm talking. Well, head. no, no, no. <laughs> I was gonna like if you go deep into like the encryption and blah 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 blah. It gets kind of. It's the same. None of it's none of it's different. Oh, I thought they use just, um like a different. They use encrypted chips. They use they use they use like they use like secure element chipsets. Well, well, some of them do. Not all of them do. The whole, the whole key on a hardware wallet is that you have a, a specific device that never touches the internet mm. that generates your keys in the same way you would generate them in any other wallet. And and then the keys never leave. So like you, you have to craft a transaction, send it to it, and then it signs that transaction and gives it back so you can broadcast it on the network. The hardware wallet's going to be the most ancient tool that's the thing that's going to be in the museum's hardcore when we're like in our 50 late no 50s. it'll just be integrated like a separate okay, separate hardware wallets yeah like these like but like no they won't they'll always be useful because well, you'll always want something now here's the thing that's that's always going to be a useful thing period because uh when you're talking about money mm-hmm. and you're talking about having something that potentially has the highest level of security with a good amount of usability um then you're going to need something that's like use case specific so if you're talking about holding a tremendous amount of money you're only going to want to use something that is designed to do that one thing and nothing else and so over time hardware wallets are going to be integrated into all of our devices so that we have a really good level of security um on how to how to do key management so that's all all wallets do. All, all wallet is a, is a key manager. I think that. Go and, ahead. but like when you're talking about a shitload of money, you don't want that integration. You don't want additional attack vectors on potential ways for people to get into it. You want something that's separate, and and guaranteed to be secure for that specific use case. So hardware wallets aren't aren't going to go away. They just may not be as prolific as we see them today. I'm thinking way innovative, man. I'm thinking banks. I'm thinking ATM machines in every house. That's what your wallet is. That's what crypto is. Like, you don't need that shit. Yeah, I know. But, like, from a marketing standpoint, if, like, every house has a little terminal and that's their key management terminal and then different businesses can integrate with when I say integrate, I don't mean like software, hardware. I mean like with humans, can integrate with humans via their their personal key terminal, whatever we call that thing. Like, then that to me seems kind of neat, and I don't I don't see I don't see that not being something, some sort of terminal that houses all of your your private keys, and then you're talking about a it's what's called an HSM as a hardware security module. Sure, it's got to be more marketable than that, though, because that's not that's not getting anybody's dick hard. It's got to be. Yeah, but they are they are marketable. People already do that. Like you know, you think about Grid Plus, the Grid Plus uh, oh, Lattice nice. Lattice yeah, One one is an HSM. That one's dope. That's an HSM. That, I feel like they're all into something with that. I feel like that's something that's digestible. This is what I'm getting at, and you know, I've said this many times on the show. I I want a documentary about it. Does anybody out there make documentaries? I'll fly out to where I am, Joe. A fl- who? Joe Siebert. He's in the. Team. Oh shit! He's in the. Slide. Yeah, man, Joe. I'm talking to you. I'll fly out to where I he am. Listening. And don't don't do that. He might be listening. And we're gonna do a documentary. My buddy, I know he's not listening. On <laughs> inner the devices that integrate with humans that are digestible and humans accept. 
the modem, the router. These aren't incredibly, these are very complicated devices, but somehow humanity's just accepted it as like, okay, I plug it in, I push a button, I'm good to go. I don't need to worry about anything else. Is that it? We're good? Like that kind of stuff. Like what makes these devices that like basically are the conduit from the way things were to the way things are so digestible? And there's going to have to be, there has to be something like that for crypto. Has to be. I don't see the, any way around it. It's a totally different network. It behaves differently. It, it does things differently. It communicates differently. It propagates probably the same. I don't know the science. Yeah, those are like I think those are I think you, those are layer twos, right? I think that's that's going to be a, an overlay network on top of all of the underlying money networks, which are the cryptocurrencies. It's going to be a thing that. Like allows for a little bit more convenience and use cases at the cost of maybe potentially the cost of some of the kind of guarantees you have. Mm-hmm. And it's going to have 30,000 barcodes on it, just like routers and modems do because of the legalese involved. But we just, we just talked about this on, on hashing it out. Like when I interviewed Vitalik, if you didn't listen to that, you should go listen to it. It's a great interview It was on hashing it out. Um, like he talks about those uh, trade-offs you have to make when you when you have specific features in the in the base layer protocol and like how difficult that is and when you start bringing humans into that the assumptions of how something works and trying to like guess human behavior and then pro, like program it you're probably going to be wrong and so those like those should probably be delegated to um, a second layer network yeah trying to anticipate human behavior on the long term is quite possibly one of the most grand exercises in futility that you could possibly do. <laughs> like, yeah. Cause one, like we change so much and so many people are different and like, we're just, it's, it's such a broad spectrum. You like you can't generalize yeah. human behavior. You, can't. you really can't get put it to you like this. Very, very uh, lame, I guess not layman, but, a very stupid way to think about it is that uh, Zuckerberg started Facebook to get laid and now he has geopolitical power. Like, did he, he, he can sway governments with the stroke of a, of keys. Zuckerberg can Twitter started as a fun way to get just a short couple of statements off of your mind. And now is controlling presidential campaigns in the United States. So it's like you can't, you can't, there's no way to predict human behavior. I don't think there's no way to, to predict what it's going to do and how it's going to interact with something. So, but anyways, I digress. You know what pisses me off? It's another digression, I guess, or or coming back to the, the other stuff. It's like that interview we did with Vitalik was, was really good. Um, but I, I asked a lot of negative, like potentially negative facing questions. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like what are your regrets of initial F1 implementation launch? Like we could talk to the founder. And so, you know, half a decade down the line or however many years it's been, mm-hmm. discuss. I want to discuss with him, like now that you've gone through all this experience, how do you feel about it? What could you have done better? What are you trying to do now to fix those issues? Like what is something that came up that became a serious issue that you didn't even think about back then and stuff like that. And so like, because those are, those are important questions to talk about as we think about how the space moves and the consequences of the earlier decisions that we as a, as a group have made over the, over the years. And like, it turned out to be like a really fantastic interview where he was honest. He was very like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, self-aware know, he, he laid it out like he was, he was he was real he was he was real about mm-hmm. it and, and, and a very realistic scenario and, and and a way of like actively thinking about regrets mistakes consequences or whatever decisions you made in your younger years based on the knowledge you had back then and the fucking media just comes out with like a bunch of negative articles to try and <laughs> i saw that like it, it happened to me like I, it, like you see it you know it exists yeah. But then it happens to you. 
And you're like, that wasn't like, that's way out of context, bro. Or like, did you hear the whole interview? It's like, it's very, mm-hmm. in my opinion, positive about where we can go and how much better we are about understanding what this technology mm-hmm. can do. Then you read in media, it's like, you know, Ethereum hates, hates, you know, Vitalik hates Ethereum. So move on. Vitalik. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, that's not, <laughs> Vitalik hates all the developers in Ethereum because he said one thing that was not even kind of negative, yeah. but it's real negative. It's, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad to see that one article. Fucking that media twats. Coin Telegraph was like Vitalik is having second second uh, thoughts about his invention, and you should too. Meanwhile, investing in this other thing that pays us to write this article, and it's like, <laughs> what the fuck? It's so fucking gross. It's it's disgusting. It's pretty gross, man. And that's but that's that's the standard, right? And in that court, that's how media works and and, and it's and it's it's the 99.99 percent of all media articles that you read is probably somewhere in that bubble and then like a few that are like have incredible journalistic integrity and don't take things out of context yep one of the hardest things to do in crypto is a phrase that i now fully understand i used to use it because it's coy and it's cute but it's like you can't clean a pig by muscle by uh you can't clean a pig in its pink sty or something like that. Like you can't clean a pig by getting in the mud you should, with it. You should it. come up with your aphorisms a little better. It wasn't, yeah, <laughs> that, that anything is like you you know if you wrestle with a pig you're just gonna get dirty too. And that's like eighty five to ninety percent of crypto. Whenever I log into crypto Twitter, I'm just like these people. Ugh, these people are uh, a, dirty a bunch now. of fucking. <laughs> slimy and then it's just like okay and so that's the hardest thing in crypto is when you find people that are genuine and authentic and like aren't slimy then you just gotta hold on to them because at this point in the game those people are few further and fewer between yeah but that's that's not be unfair here this isn't just crypto no it's not just crypto like, but you were, you've been a business consultant for quite a while now you've seen a lot of business Mm-hmm. And the like the back end, the back ends of businesses, mm-hmm. and I would assure that you say it's also pretty gross there. And we've been sort of talking about the financial industry and like how we're worried about them coming into this industry. Yeah, everything's fucking gross. Humans are gross. Yeah, we we're, <laughs> we're pretty gross. We're pretty gross, but we try. So, I guess we can end it there. Then I guess we didn't have an interview. Yeah. Um, you know, as you guys, it's a great way to way to end the episode. All you listeners, yeah. you're fucking, you gross. fucking nasty asses. <laughs> Speaking of which, Thanks this episode guys. is brought to you by Dude Wipes. Wipe your nasty ass, dudes. <laughs> uh, I wish, I wish we had such good like product placement. Oh my god, we could do things like I wish. that. I miss, I miss the one time that we had um, Butcher Box. Yeah. We need more jingles. Like, well, to... wait, we have a sponsorship yeah, going. I on. miss the all the jingles. We got a where's where's uh. Where's uh, Star Soccer? He just come back. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll give you the escrow service back for a cheap avalanche. Right? We we need to talk about Ava. We talk about Ava. Is that going on the show? I thought it was hashing it out only. I think it's all. It's the, everything. It's everything that we do. And it's all. It's all pre roll. Yeah. Like ha- Avalanche has has signed the contract for pre roll, so that's what we're giving yeah. them. As much as I love them, I can talk about them a lot. Okay. Well, we gave y'all we gave them pre roll. So. Check out Avalanche. Other than that, guys, um, <laughs> thank you for listening to episode 314 of the Bitcoin Podcast. Um, join the Slack. Hit us up on Twitter. Uh, we hope you like the tweets. Come hang out with me, Corey, Andy, Alicia, Jesse, JT, Joe. There's so many great people in the Slack. The Slack is like way bigger than us now i think that's the I, i'd say the slack is where the majority of this community talks and comes up with things there's so many conversations mm-hmm. going on in these channels that i'm almost I'm, I'm not able to keep up with it anymore yeah and it's really good conversations i mean random i think it's pretty fucking random mm-hmm. but like all the channels that are crypto specific or like have a lot of people in there that are contributing quite a bit of great material i mean we've seen projects come like from zero to production yeah within the community it's a su- that are now just like they just they just hang out but like they own useful products in the ecosystem yeah it's very it's very neat to be a part of and have grown 
Started all the way at Zap Chain, baby. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, thing, that thing sucked. It's so shitty, but it was. We tried so hard. We tried so hard to make that it, work, and it just it didn't just work. Didn't. It, it's such a good idea, though. But anywho, uh, if you if you learned anything from this episode, it is go learn how to program some of this programmable money with an easy initial intent of just trying to get laid at your university. Right. <laughs> and then you're going to you you have no idea how monumentally wealthy you will be in more ways than one. So college listener, Is that investment advice. Yes. College listener. And the, it's always the best investment <laughs> to invest in yourself, Corey. College listener. I know you're listening and you're trying to get laid because that's like 80 percent of college. Make something with crypto that's going to get you laid. And boom, you're going to be the next Zuckerberg. People are you're gonna your face. People are gonna be trying to boycott you one day, right? That's, we only want one percent. Powerful. All right. Shout out to Zoe Saldana and Zazi Beats. Uh, play the outro.